What are you doing, kiddo? You really gonna go through with this? I'm gonna find... and I'm gonna kill... every last one of them. I'm the Seth Rukage, or Jose, or Seth, or whatever you want to call me, doesn't matter. And now that the dust is settled, we're going to be discussing the controversy that surrounded one of the most highly anticipated sequels of all time, The Last of Us 2. But before we do, I just want to remind you to click like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter, and to check out my Twitch account where I update my streaming schedule weekly. This wave of controversy came long before it was even released, due to story leaks that occurred months prior, and the trolls took advantage of it. But in order to even begin broaching this, we need to squash the keep politics out of media argument, as it's used by detractors to air quote criticize the game as a piece of liberal propaganda because it includes gay and trans characters, a buff woman, and allegedly sidelines a male protagonist. This is a slogan perpetuated by people like the Quartering, grifters that spew vapid bullshit devoid of logic so that they could feel the internet hate machine to produce that sweet, sweet clickbait ad revenue from their teenage and incel fanbase. The defense of keep politics out of games is nothing more than a shallow attempt at a scapegoat for those looking to hide the fact that they want to censor groups from being represented in media, namely women, LGBT people, and minority communities. If you discriminate against LGBT people, you are by definition homophobic. If in Frozen 3 Elsa gets a boyfriend, there wouldn't be an ounce of outrage from these crowds, but if she gets a girlfriend, there's an outpouring of homophobic videos and comments posted on the internet. Anti-censorship warriors are hypocrites. It's hilarious that the right is enamored with the ad hominem snowflake when they're the ones consistently offended by the mere existence of the aforementioned groups being represented in media. When presented with a microscopic pride flag on the desk in an indie game, one angry gamer lambasted is the gay agenda and calls for its censorship. When a female-led movie comes out, the quartering spends 30 plus videos beating the dead horse into a bloody pulp by harassing the actress for anything and everything, calling for Hollywood to go back to non-political movies that don't involve women. When games journalists or people like Anita Sarkeesian try to highlight the disparity of representation and how to improve upon on it, content creators claim they're trying to fundamentally ruin video games before sicking their audience to harass them. These groups claim to be anti-censorship and that they treasure authorial intent above any and all causes that could dilute it. P.S. You should kind of already see how the first example contradicts this. But when they're confronted with a situation where their beloved anime titties are censored by a company, they blame the evil SJWs for polluting their media, free speech, and creators' intent. These people don't give a flying fuck about free speech or censorship. They adopt the shield when it's advantageous for them. Literally everything is political. When these people see gay representation, they claim that the product is just too political now, and that it should either be removed, otherwise they won't engage with it. This is the weakest and most hypocritical part of their argument because, once again, virtually every piece of art or media is political. For a small example of games that contain politics, let's look at my ever-expanding Steam library. Mass Effect depicts racism, war, mercenary PMCs, socioeconomics, gang warfare, religious zealotry, artificial sentience, and genocide. Bioshock shows the consequences of endgame capitalism, religion, libertarianism, and ethics and science. Dishonored tackles monarchies, poverty, cults, and police brutality. Final Fantasy VII approaches environmentalism, classism, poverty, corporations controlling society and the consequences of eco-terrorism. Game of Thrones is entirely politics, and even The Witcher, one of the most highly esteemed hardcore capital G gamers games, is entirely political. Even Avatar The Last Airbender is ostensibly one of the most political kids shows in existence, and it tackles imperialism, genocide, child abuse, prison systems, the patriarchy, fascism, propaganda, 
secret police, governmental oppression, and war crimes, just to name a few. This doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. Albeit, you'll be hard-pressed to extrapolate any deep political meaning out of fucking Pong or Pac-Man. Metal Gear Solid is one of the most explicit cases of shoving politics down your throat, and listing the topics it addresses warrants its own video. The weak will be purged, and the strongest will thrive. Free to live as they see fit. They'll make America great again! What the hell are you talking about? The angry YouTube white dudes never cried to keep politics out for the previous examples, so it's almost as if they just don't want the previously mentioned groups in their games. Okay, so now that that's out of the way for the idiots on the internet, we can address the other points of contention. Let's start with the biggest spoiler moment that got leaked before the game's release. Joel gets brutally murdered by Abby, and that you'll be playing as her for half of the game. Let's get this straight. Killing off a main character doesn't equal bad, and using that as a fundamental basis of criticism is childish. Narratives gain strength when consequences are real, and if you can't handle serious narratives, you really shouldn't watch something like Game of Thrones. It really isn't that surprising seeing Angry Joe throw a tantrum over this, as his trademark Superman shirt is indicative of a preference towards heroes and never face adversary of any real lasting consequence. This moment is designed to piss Ellie, and therefore you as the player off. The character that you've been attached to since 2013 has been sadistically tortured and killed in front of your eyes, with the salt of the wound being an unreconciled relationship, never being able to come full circle. You're supposed to hate Abby. You're supposed to want to kill her. That's the point. However, when it's revealed why Abby killed Joel, it turns out she is entirely morally justified. Joel fucked over the entire human race and murdered both the Fireflies and Abby's father. Joel is a monster, regardless of his intentions of protecting Ellie. You can simultaneously love a character while recognizing their failings. I love Joel and understand the choice that he made, and I was more than happy to partake in his actions in the previous game's climax. But at the end of the day, he got what he deserved. The police get what you fucking deserve! Abby is revealed throughout her section of the game as the opposite of the same coin as Ellie. Abby's reason for revenge starts with the death of her father years prior, where Ellie's begins with Joel's murder. Abby's descent into obsession is shown throughout flashbacks, while Ellie rampages throughout Seattle murdering the WLF and Abby's friends. Abby manages to get her revenge on Joel, whereas Ellie's initial failure to kill Abby only pushes her further into madness before leaving her obsession behind because of the damage it's done to her and those around her. They go through the exact same journey on separate timelines. I loved spending time with Abby and learning who she is as a person, learning the quirks of her personality and what her priorities and goals were. As the game progressed, I found myself rooting for her instead of Ellie. Abby gets the rest of the game to cool down and to reflect upon her actions, going as far as to help Lev and Yara to bring good back into the world. Ellie's personality, on the other hand, is comparatively muted as the game continues, as she becomes a one-track mind intent on exacting revenge. So for the people of Seti Spaghetti that you play as Joel's killer, that's the point of the entire narrative. The point is to sympathize with Abby, realize that she's morally justified, and that revenge taints who you are as a person, harms those around you, and passes on the baton of revenge to create a perpetual cycle. If you get too hung up on Joel's death to actually play the game and recognize the point of the narrative, that's on you. It's also incredibly disingenuous to chalk up the themes of the game to revenge bad, or saying that Ellie forgave the person that killed her surrogate father. If you legitimately think that Ellie forgives Abby, you were not paying attention. This game is not about forgiveness. It's about letting go of your obsessions. Ellie's actions resulted in the loss of who she is as a person, her friends, girlfriend, child, and her connection to Joel. Losing her fingers and the ability to play guitar symbolizes this, as her inaccessibility to her instrument has severed a spiritual means to remember Joel. Granted, she could have just pulled a Jimi Hendrix and learned to be a lefty. Kind of a pain, but 
possible. She had the perfect opportunity to leave the issue alone after Abby let her live on both occasions, and she threw it all away. The theme of obsession is evidenced in scenes chronologically prior, as flashbacks show Ellie's refusal to let go of what really occurred at that hospital. Finding out the truth of this only led to the divide between her and Joel. Nothing material was gained from Joel's confession, and they could have spent more time together before he was ultimately killed. As for the memes floating around the internet, the majority of them can widely fuck off. Women can be ripped as hell, and the game even goes out of its way to show Abby's ease of access to a gym. Having different body physiques and media will help destroy this misconception that ignorant people have. Freeze framing memes are redundant regardless of the source, as they ignore the context of motion. In regards to the sex scene, the memes claiming that the director Neil Druckmann self inserted himself into the story to fulfill some sort of fantasy is outright moronic and blatantly false. People disingenuously confuse Neil Druckmann with the actor for Manny, who isn't even in the scene. Owen is played by this guy. The fact that this meme is so far spread is fucking migraine inducing. I loved everything about the character swap and the utilization of misleading fans with trailers. It's the exact reason why I loved Metal Gear Solid 2 when it first came out. I hate trailers for any piece of media, as they inherently spoil scenes that you know will eventually happen. Showing Joel in that trailer tricked fans into thinking that he would have a more prominent role, and at the very least, be immune from death up until that scene played out. Having Joel die in the opening hours is made all the more impactful because of it. As soon as something sells me on its concept, I want nothing to do with trailers. I want to experience the piece of media as blind as possible and untainted by outside sources. And addressing the entirety of the game design would take another video, but I'll just chot down some simple talking points. I love the Metal Gear Solid 5 levels of stealth. Slowly sneaking your way across a field, utilizing tall grass, and diving into water drastically changes the way that you can approach encounters. A section with an emphasis on utilizing linked bodies of water to sneak up on enemies was a standout moment and it makes you feel like an 80s slasher villain. I've never really understood the criticism of Naughty Dog's games having poor combat, as Uncharted's gunplay is great and accentuated by fluidly transitioning back and forth between platforming and melee as necessary, with the multiplayer of Uncharted 4 reaching new heights, excuse the pun, with the grappling hook. The Last of Us places an emphasis on limited ammunition, with a purposeful weapon sway encouraging a more methodical approach to combat encounters, where a bullet or two can mean a world of difference between success and death. Part 2 also adds dodging into the mix, with a small enough window of invulnerability that you're forced to read your opponent's movements carefully. The violence even outside of the story beats has been dialed up to 11, with bodies being eviscerated by guns, melee weapons, and explosives alike. Allies calling out each other's names as they get picked off is just another narrative gut punch that you're killing not just some random goon, but somebody that has friends and family and their own story that isn't being delved into. The biggest criticism I have with the game is the pacing, which in of itself can be considered a conscious decision to accentuate the narrative. The myriad of open spaces and dead air between encounters and narrative beats can feel like untrimmed fat, regardless of what it adds to the atmosphere, as stumbling through environments often just kind of creates an unintentional frustration. This fat is accentuated by having to scrounge for supplies throughout the environments, which I typically don't mind in survival horror titles, but the result here is tedious due to how expansive the maps can be. The entirety of the California segment goes far past the steam that the narrative generates, but this feeling of exhaustion mirrors the narrative and meta experience of thinking to yourself that Ellie needs to just let go and go home already that this entire expedition is pointless. And despite loving the general effectiveness of the character swap, Abby's adventures throughout Seattle suffer from having too much fat on its bones. I'm personally a fan of forcing players to wait until the last 10% of the game to return to the theater confrontation. It's Hitchcock's bomb under the table utilized to a teasing perfection. Needless to say, 
the payoff for the theater fight was worth it. The strength of the narrative is no more clear than the fact that I was rooting for Abby to kill Ellie, who was one of my most beloved characters in any storytelling medium to date. And when the tables were turned in the finale, I was disgusted by having to control Ellie. And with that, I just want to go ahead and remind everybody to click like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, check out my Twitch account where I update my streaming schedule weekly. All the links for everything will be down below. Alright, thank you guys.